In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. This Low Sunday is dedicated to the virtue of faith. We see St. Thomas, first of all, unbelieving because he had not seen and because he would not believe those who had reported it, even the other apostles. But today he believes because he sees. But faith is assent to things that are unseen and assent to things that we take on the testimony of others. And in this case, it is the testimony of God. We believe the truths of the Catholic faith based on the testimony of God. And the motive for our belief is the authority of God revealing. Today, I would like to begin, therefore, a series of sermons on Holy Providence, which is also an object of our faith. Our faith is not confined to the dogmas of the Trinity and Incarnation and other great dogmas of the Church, but also very much to Holy Providence, the will of God that is fulfilled throughout all eternity. And this is especially important for our spiritual lives because by belief in Holy Providence, we live the faith. Not only do we assent intellectually to it, but we live the faith. Now, there are a few points that need to be reviewed concerning providence. One is that God not only created the world from nothing, but also maintains it in existence every single moment of the day. So for God, the act of creation of the whole universe and the maintaining of that creation in existence every moment of the day is one and the same act. He even maintains the sinner in existence when he is sinning against him, when he is blaspheming him. He maintains him in existence. He maintains the devil in existence. Second, the purpose of creation was a single end, and that is the manifestation of God's goodness. Third, all movement in the entire universe is dependent upon God as prime mover. I'll give you an example, an analogy. Think of a wind-up clock. You wind the main spring, and the power of that main spring gets into all of the little gears that move the hands. If you open a, a wind-up clock, you'll see all sorts of things moving about back and forth. That is all from the power of the main spring. So also, God moves all things by his providence, by his will. And even though there are secondary causes, just as there are many gears that move the hands, so also God moves through secondary causes. But nonetheless, the power of everything comes from him. Just as in a series of dominoes, which fall if you press one at the front, all move by the power of the hand moving it at the front. Fourth, all things that happen in the universe are moved by him ultimately as prime mover. They are all known by him and are foreseen by him from all eternity are willed by him, or at least permitted by him, from all eternity. And all are intended for the manifestation of his goodness and his glory. Even the most evil and wicked things that happen, they are permitted by God for ultimately the manifestation of his glory. Five, nothing escapes his knowledge or his will. 
not even the most minute activity. An ant cannot move his leg without the knowledge and the will of God, without it having been foreseen from all eternity, without his moving him. Not a single tiny thing can happen. The reproduction of bacteria, all the movements of the fishes in the sea, Nothing can happen without his will and his power and his foresight. Six, consequently, God governs every action of the universe, whether it is of living things, whether it is of non-living things, great things such as planets and stars, or tiny things such as the tiniest insect, and directs all of this toward his glory. And as great as a star or a planet may be, there is more of God's creation in the tiniest insect than there is in the largest planet or the biggest star. St. Thomas says, all things that exist in whatsoever manner are necessarily directed by God toward some end. Very important principle. Seven, this means that with the exception of sin, which is an absence of good, a good that should be there, all things have God as their first cause and sometimes even their exclusive cause, as when God performs a miracle or when he moves you by grace, as he moves St. Paul in his conversion or the conversion of many other sinners. Eight, this universal governance of God does not destroy, but safeguards the freedom of our actions. Everyone says when they hear about providence, they hear about the foreknowledge of God of all events, they think, well, we must be by, like robots. Everything is foreseen. We are just living a script, and we have no free will. That is the most common objection. But no, this is not true. Because providence extends not only to what we will do, <clears throat> but also to the manner in which we will do it. That is, by our own free choice and election. So God, who is the author of grace, and of our free wills does not violate our free will by moving us by his actual grace. Because the things of God do not conflict. There is no violence. He made both. And he could not violate our free will without exterminating our free will because the freedom of our will is very much a part of our nature. Number nine, therefore, God knows each one of us intimately. Our strengths and our weaknesses, he made them. He made our strengths and he knows our weaknesses. And consequently moves us toward the good with both a gentleness and a strength. He moves us infallibly toward the good, but with a gentleness whereby it does not violate our free choice. And number 10, although God's providence extends to all things, 
both to the great things and to the tiniest things. Nevertheless, God governs the lower creation through the higher. So there is a gradation in creation, higher beings and lower beings, and the higher beings govern the lower beings. That is the normal government of God in creation. He will occasionally step in and set aside these secondary causes, as in the case of certain miracles regarding saints, for example, that certain saints were not burned by fire. He can, as author of nature, suspend the physical effects of fire. And that's where he sets aside the hierarchy of causes, the physical laws, steps in and does what he pleases. <clears throat> now, let us look at some of the texts from the Old Testament that exemplify what I have said. First, the prayer of Mordecai. The Jews were in captivity by a Persian king by the name of Ammon, and Ammon wanted the Jews, really everybody, to adore him. If you recall from Holy Saturday, there was also the requirement of Nebuchadnezzar to ad adore his statue. And the Jews would not do it. Everybody else did because it was just another god to adore, another idol, who cares? But the Jews would not do it. They believed in the one God who could not be seen. So the penalty was death, and the Jews were faced with extermination by this Ammon. And Mordecai prayed to God in this way. O Lord, Lord, almighty God, King, for all things are in thy power, and there is none that can resist thy will if thou determine to save Israel. Thou hast made heaven and earth and all things that are under the cope of heaven. Thou art Lord of all, and there is none that can resist thy majesty. Thou knowest all things, and thou knowest that it was not out of pride and contempt or any desire of glory that I refused to worship the proud Ammon but I feared lest I should transfer the honor of my God to a man. And now, O Lord, O King, O God of Abraham, have mercy on thy people, because our enemies resolve to destroy us and to extinguish thy inheritance. Hear my supplication and be merciful to thy lot and inheritance, and turn our mourning into joy that we may live and praise thy name. And this expresses all of the principles that I gave you concerning providence. Now listen to what his daughter Esther said. She was his adopted daughter, actually a cousin of his. She was actually brought before the king himself in order to adore him and to live by this rule of adoring him. Listen to what she said in her prayer. Remember, O Lord, and show thyself to us in the time of our tribulation, and give me boldness, O Lord, King of gods and of all power. Give me a well-ordered speech in my mouth in the presence of the lion, referring to Ammon, and turn his heart to the hatred of our enemy, that both he himself may perish and the rest that consent to him. But deliver us by thy hand, and help me who have no other helper but thee, O Lord, who hast knowledge of all things. And thou knowest that I hate the glory of the wicked, O God, who art mighty above all, hear the voice of them that have no other hope, and deliver us from the hand of the wicked, and deliver me from my fear. 
And what happened? The king relented with regard to the Jews and then later was killed. What is clear from these texts is that God's will and government reaches down to the smallest details and into the hearts of men moving their free actions as he will. Providence, however certain, remains at times unfathomable. This is especially true when we contemplate the tribulations of the just. Many of us say, why do the good suffer if we are obeying the commandments, leading a good life? Why do we suffer? Conversely, why do the evil prosper? They should be punished, but many of them are rich. Many of them are enjoying life to the fullest and seem to have no problems at all. Very common objection. Listen to some of sacred scripture concerning this. Book of Proverbs. As the divisions of waters, so the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, whithersoever he will, he shall turn it. Every way of a man seemeth right to himself, but the Lord weigheth the hearts. Ecclesiasticus, as the potter's clay is in his hand to fashion it and order it, all his ways are according to his ordering. So man is in the mind, is in the hand of him that made him and he will render to him according to his judgment. The book of Isaiah. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it be. And as I have proposed, so shall it fall out, that I will destroy the Assyrian in my land, meaning the invaders into Israel, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot, and his yoke shall be taken away from them, and his burden shall be taken off their shoulder. This is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations, for the Lord of hosts hath decreed, and who can disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it away? Listen to the to Judith, there was a, a Chaldean army under, excuse me, an Assyrian army under the leadership of the general Holofernes, and they threatened the small town on the border of the Holy Land. And if that small town fell, they would overrun the whole land. And so the Jews were putting up a stand against Holofernes, but Holofernes greatly outnumbered them and had far more power than they did, and there was a practical certitude that this little town called Betulia would fall. And so the high priest goes to Judith, who was a very holy widow, and said, would you go, she was a beautiful woman as well, Would you go to Holofernes and beg for mercy? And she put on magnificent clothing. She was beautifully dressed. And she went over to the camp of Holofernes. And she so impressed the soldiers there that they said, Oh, Holofernes would be very, very happy to receive you. And she goes to the tent of Holofernes and she begs mercy. But before she did that, she made this prayer. She made this speech, rather. She says, and now, brethren, referring to her fellow Jews, as you are the ancients among the people of God, and their very soul resteth upon you, she's talking to the high priests, 
Comfort their hearts by your speech, that they may be mindful how our fathers were tempted, that they might be proved whether they worshipped their God truly. That they might be proved whether they worshipped their God truly. Very important words. They must remember, she continues, how our father Abraham was tempted and being proved by many tribulations was made the friend of God. So Isaac, so Jacob, so Moses, and all that have pleased God passed through many tribulations, remaining faithful. But they that did not receive the trials with the fear of the Lord, but uttered their impatience and the reproach of their murmuring against the Lord, were destroyed by the destroyer and perished by serpents. As for us, therefore, let us not revenge ourselves for these things which we suffer, but esteeming these very punishments to be less than our sins deserve, let us believe that these scourges of the Lord, which, with which, like servants, we are chastised, have happened for our amendment and not for our destruction. Very important principle that one of the motives of the suffering of the just is for their correction, for their amendment, because God loves them and wants to bring them to a higher perfection, wants to prove their friendship. Those who reject the amendment of God. And those, as, Saint, as Judas says, do not accept these tribulations in the fear of the Lord, are destroyed. And what happened in the tent? Holofernes ordered that a meal be prepared, a very sumptuous meal, and he got drunk. And Judith took his sword and cut off his head, put it in her bag, and brought it back to the little town of Bethulia and held it up. And that was the victory of God over an enemy that by human standards was unable to be conquered. Now this, all of this is very important for our own period in the church because we too stand before an unconquerable, excuse me, an enemy that cannot be conquered. Powers that, humanly speaking, far exceed our powers. And I'm referring to the Novus Ordo hierarchy. There is, humanly speaking, we have no power against them. And our preservation from their corruption is completely by the power of God. And because God has given us graces to resist this thing, they intend to despoil our inheritance, as Mordecai said, to destroy Catholicism as we have known it since before Vatican II and as it goes back to the early ages of the church, back to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. They want to do the same thing that Ammon did or wanted to do to the Jews. And they want to do the same thing that Holofernes wanted to do to the Jews. And these holy people of the Old Testament profess their faith in God, their faith in the providence of God, and put all of their hope and confidence in God alone, and they were delivered. Our situation is exactly the same. We are helpless before this tidal wave of Vatican II, which has destroyed everything that we have held sacred for centuries upon centuries. 
and we must pray to God with the same hope and confidence. Isaiah said, speaking in the name of God, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are exalted above the earth, so are my ways exalted above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts, teaching us that the ways of God are unfathomable and inscrutable. So from these texts of sacred scripture, we understand three great characteristics of God's providence. First, that it is infallible. It never makes a mistake. God's will never goes undone. And it is infallible even with regard to our free actions. Second, that it directs all things to good that good being the glory of God, even the most evil things. And third, that it is inscrutable and unfathomable. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.